International Women's Day is a global day celebrating the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women throughout history and all across the globe. And is typically a day for women from all different backgrounds and cultures to bond together to achieve success. Women stand at the front lines of the COVID-19 crisis as healthcare workers, caregivers, innovators, community organizers, and as some of the most exemplary and effective national leaders in combating the pandemic. Today, there is more acceptance than ever before that women bring different experiences, perspectives, and skills to the table and make irreplaceable contributions to decisions, policies and laws that work better for all. I am Archana, consultant from Grimsby Hospital and along with my two other consultant colleagues, Jenny and Poonam, we have put this event together despite of being very busy at the forefront of the pandemic crisis as you can imagine. We hope you take full advantage of this opportunity to get benefited from this. On the occasion of International Women's Day, we are holding a health awareness campaign to provide information on how to get prepared for health related stressful periods in life, be it physical or mental health. Some talks are focusing on women's health issues and others are on general health and wellness of everyone. We have tried to keep it very simple. There will be a session on meditation and a physical activity at the end. This event is fun raising funds for the Pink Rose Breast Care Suite at Grimsby Hospital and Breast Care Services in Scunthorpe General Hospital, supporting advanced breast cancer and lymph node targeting equipment. There is a Just Giving page created for today's event and we request you to donate generously. Your feedback is very important to us. So please do write in a comment section or email it to us. Details are given in the description box. So let's get this event started and I hope you like it. Thank you. Hello everybody. My name is Jenny Smith. I'm a consultant oncoplastic breast surgeon at the Diana Princess of Wales Hospital in Grimsby. Our breast unit is called the Pink Rose Suite and it's the Pink Rose Charity for which we're uh, raising funds today. So thank you all for joining in and I hope this is enjoyable and useful for you. And thank you for any generous contributions. Just a little bit of background uh, for our breast service. So uh, our population is approximately the same as the population of Ice, Iceland, something like 420,000, and that's our catchment area for this breast service. Um, and we have uh, a breast unit, but we cover essentially two hospital sites with some services. And we offer a comprehensive service for breast cancer, including reconstructive surgery in partnership with plastic surgery and whole. Um, and we also do other reconstructive and symmetry procedures. So that's a little bit of background. But uh, what I wanted to talk to you today about is nostalgia. Nostalgia is breast pain. Um, and especially at the moment with COVID and with the added stresses and strains of COVID, I would say we have about one in 10 referrals involves breast pain or nostalgia. And you may well have experienced this, and I would, I would guess that most women have experienced nostalgia during their lives. Of course, we think typically of nostalgia during the cycle, the menstrual cycle, and that sort of premenstrual tenderness in the breasts. But breast pain comes in many forms, and it can be quite troublesome. And it makes people worried that they may have something serious going on in their breasts, very understandably, uh, and it makes them worried about breast cancer. So let's talk a little bit about what to do if you get breast pain. And if you get breast pain, it's perfectly reasonable to use very simple painkillers. 
painkillers that you get on well with, like paracetamol or ibuprofen. And uh, to take a painkiller if it's really bothering you and if you know it's going to distract you from what you're doing that day, it's fine to take a painkiller. If the breast pain lasts for more than six weeks, then it may be worth seeking uh, a referral by your family doctor to make sure there isn't anything more serious going on. But in the meantime, what you can do is have a little look at your bras, see if they fit all right. And, and the way to tell is to take off your bra after you've worn it for some hours at the end of the day. Doesn't that feel great? You take off your bra and, whoa, you know, it feels great, doesn't it? And have a little look in the mirror, see if you've got any marks digging into you, especially on the sides of the breasts, on the insides of the breast. And a bra should hold the breast nicely um, without digging in here or there. It should cup the breast nicely. Some people like to be able to see their cleavage. Some people want a more full bra. It doesn't really matter. But a bra that fits well and not too tight around the chest band but supports the breasts well, that's what you want. And it doesn't really matter either whether it's wired or unwired. Underwired bras are not dangerous. They don't lead to breast cancer, um, but having a, a well-fitting bra is good. You can get some tips on the internet as to how to fit a bra, or you can, you can find a, a retailer that offers fitting. Um, and I think that's a good thing to do. Um, in terms of other things that may relate to breast pain, so the breasts are extremely hormonal and breast pain largely does have some sort of link to a hormonal change, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your hormones are abnormal and it doesn't necessarily mean that your breasts are abnormal. But it may be that for whatever reason, your breast tissue has become more sensitive to a change in your hormones or just to your normal hormone cycle. And that can happen on just one side. So breast pain that occurs more on one side is not unusual at all. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a serious problem in that breast. Um, most women don't have symmetrical breasts. Most women have one breast that's bigger than the other. And so um, it's not unusual for the breast that has a little more breast tissue to be more painful. The other thing that's not unusual is it's not unusual to feel the pain in the upper outer part of the breast and towards the armpit area or what we call the axilla that's very very typical because actually that's where the majority of the breast tissue is or or you have more breast tissue in that part of your breast than elsewhere and it's also very typical to have tenderness at the nipple and behind the nipple and that's because there's a lot of nerve endings there and also a lot of breast tissue so that's not unusual again it doesn't necessarily mean there's something serious going on in your breast um, and that may be relatively straightforward and simple breast pain. So just to reassure you, it is fine to try simple measures, check that your bra fits, take simple painkillers and sit it out a little bit. Sit it out through a cycle if you are still menstruating and if you're not using contraceptives or something similar that flattens out your periods. Sit it out for a couple of cycles, that is fine. There are lots of, there's lots and lots of um, discussion about whether different foods and different supplements can be used for breast pain. Um, and one of the very common things that, that we used to use, and we used to be able to prescribe this on the NHS in England um, and in the UK, and that was evening primrose oil. So the active ingredient in, in evening primrose oil that may be relevant to breast pain is called gamma linolenic acid. And it takes a little while for the body, for the human body to absorb this particular substance. And you have to take it for two to three months before your body will have absorbed significant amounts of this product. The link is prostaglandins and it, it's a, a related to a step in prostaglandins and the prostaglandin cycle. And that's the link to hormones and to your breasts. Um, but in big population studies, they didn't find evidence, consistent and significant evidence that evening primrose oil had an impact on breast pain. Now, it is possible, of course, that perhaps um, the, the effect was very subtle and it, it just couldn't reach statistical significance, or perhaps it was actually diluted out by the very big population sample that they looked at. And certainly um, when I advise my own patients about breast pain, I do say to them they can try this. 
it can be those supplements can be expensive but for some women they feel generally more well they feel that their hair and their skin is better because prostaglandins have many different roles in the body um, and for some women it, it, it has helped their breast pain but it, it's not an evidence uh, proven effect in terms of other um, food related items and, and dietary items caffeine is also discussed and there are some women whose breast tissue seems to be more sensitive and they take in a lot of caffeine um, so of course we all think of coffee but uh, there's a lot of caffeine in tea and chocolate no you know well, I don't, I'm not going to advise anyone to stop eating chocolate but there you go uh, there is a lot of caffeine in chocolate um, there's caffeine of course in fizzy drinks so I think these things are, are perhaps worth a try in troublesome breast pain because they're simple things to address relatively simple it's not like taking a medication and it might be worth trying to reduce caffeine um, if you particularly struggle with breast pain but let's talk about the more serious causes of breast pain so in terms of of, of your concern as to whether breast pain may be an indication that you have breast cancer actually the minority of breast cancers cause pain and at least four out of five breast cancers are completely painless um, so actually the usual causes of breast pain are benign and that's really important to know um, but there are breast conditions such as cysts breast cysts whether tiny cysts or larger cysts they can be painful um, and there are other inflammatory conditions of the breast that can be painful and if your breast pain lasts for longer than a cycle um, and if it lasts for longer than six weeks then I would suggest that you approach your family doctor to be referred in for a discussion and some imaging in a breast service just to make sure there's not an underlying problem of course infectious conditions can cause breast pain but you wouldn't miss those so um, mastitis or infections of the breast they can cause breast pain and uh, women who are breastfeeding are, are uh, a little bit more at risk um, and that's just a simple mechanical thing that the little bugs that, that are on the skin can get in through cracked nipples etc etc um, and health visitors and midwives and breastfeeding advisors and all that sort of thing can advise about keeping the skin healthy and trying to avoid that condition but it can be very difficult to avoid um, and it would need treatment with antibiotics and unfortunately can occasionally cause breast abscesses which needs to be treated in the breast unit but you wouldn't miss it tender red painful people might feel feverish when they've got it um, and that's something um, that can be treated formally firstly by, by your family doctor with antibiotics um, the other thing is um, there's a group of women who develop non-lactational mastitis or breast infections not related to breastfeeding and again uh, these are present in a very similar way with redness often at the margin of the areola so the areola as you know is the colored area around the nipple and you might form a red tender lump there uh, again you wouldn't miss it exquisitely tender very short history might have had it before and it is something that's more common in smokers also needs to be treated with antibiotics so very reasonable for a family doctor to treat a patient who has a red tender breast with a course of antibiotics or perhaps more than one course as these infections may take time to clear however if you have a red tender breast often with swelling and um, if you take antibiotics from a family doctor and this does not improve then it is very important to seek referral to a breast service because just very occasionally that can be caused by something more serious and so you should seek referral if standard antibiotics don't work but as I say uh, usually nostalgia is not related to a serious cause finally uh, there are some very um, strong medications and uh, more formal treatments for very troublesome breast pain and in my practice I very rarely need to resort to these and often um, the most I need to do is discuss with my patient that these exist and these treatments include medications like tamoxifen any of you who've been involved with breast cancer will know tamoxifen 
is something we've had for many years now and we still use it um, particularly in premenopausal women as part of treatment for some breast cancers um, but you can also use it for breast pain and it has got a proven role in breast pain but it also has side effects and so it should be used carefully it should be used um, for persistent and very significant breast pain and it should be used in the hands of a specialist and so again it would it would be used for a patient who had consulted in a breast unit and had had more serious causes excluded uh, and it's very rare uh, in my practice for me to use a medication such as tamoxifen there are other medications that can be used and they all are anti-estrogens of some form uh, but they also have significant side effects um, and are not particularly popular with the patient so um, there are things out there that you can use but essentially often reassurance knowing that there's nothing terribly serious going on might be all you need so if you've been to if you had persistent breast pain and you've been to your um, breast unit you've had more serious causes excluded you've had an examination what can you do well i'm sure you don't want to be taking tablets by mouth all the time so the other thing you can use and there is good evidence for this is you can use an anti-inflammatory gel so an over-the-counter anti-inflammatory gel and if you apply a small amount several times a day to the side of the breast then there's evidence that that can help there's a lot of um, innovation of the breast comes from that lateral side that's the armpit side of the breast and you can use a small amount of gel um, and also other things that I already discussed such as a, a well-fitting bra etc good well I hope that's helpful and I hope that's reassured you uh, that breast tenderness is very very much part and parcel of our lives as women with breasts and uh, is very rarely an indication that something more serious is going on Sometimes disasters or unpleasant things happen in our lives. It all depends on how well we are prepared for it. Outcomes could be different and better if we know what's coming and ready for it. And that's what we are going to talk about today. I'm Arjuna, consultant anesthetist and lead in preoperative assessment in NLAG NHS Foundation Trust. My role is to advise patients and to get them ready for their upcoming operations ahead of time. My talk is based on the advice given by the Royal College of Anesthetists and a Center of Perioperative Care. I hope today's talk would help you to get ready for any health related stresses by doing simple changes in your lifestyle and by achieving optimum health before the disaster strikes. In the midst of a global pandemic, a major national medical organization is calling for the public to prepare themselves for the possibility they will contract COVID-19 virus in the same way they should be preparing for an operation. The Center for Perioperative Care, based at the Royal College of Anesthetists, is encouraging people to undertake various measures during this time to increase their ability to cope if the virus is contracted. CPOC has resources on fitter, better, sooner, which are used by patients preparing for an operation. It is recommended that if patients improve their health and get fitter before their operations, then they get better and could be discharged from hospital sooner. The same principles could be applied to reduce the severity of COVID-19 infection. We have good data showing that people who are prepared for an operation have better outcomes. Results are quick. For example, people who stop smoking just four weeks before an operation have 19% fewer complications. People who start an exercise program get through an anesthetic better because their heart and lungs work better and their legs are stronger for getting out of the hospital sooner. A lot of this is immediately applicable to COVID-19 infections. People are more likely to be admitted to hospital or to intensive care 
or to have an adverse outcome if they smoke, have medical condition or are unfit. What we understand about virus also shows that those people in better health usually develop milder symptoms and recover quicker from COVID-19. There has been a lot of very important advice on how we can reduce the risk of contracting COVID-19, but we have seen little on the importance of preparing ourselves in case the virus is contracted. What can you do to prepare yourself and minimize the risk of an illness should you contract the virus? Whilst we are following the national guidance on the precautions we need to take to prevent infections and being in lockdown or following the tier system for isolation, we can use this time to our advantage. There is much we can do during this time to prepare ourselves for the worst and to improve our health. Evidence shows that fitter patients recover quicker from any illness and experience fewer complications and morbidities. In China, they found less fit people with medical conditions were five times more likely to have a worse outcome from COVID-19 and smokers three times more likely to have this result. As well as saving serious illness and saving NHS capacity now, the Center for Perioperative Care is asking the public to prevent the ill health they are building up in an attempt to guard against more diabetes, obesity, hip fractures, mental ill health and need for social care when the current crisis eventually ends. This also includes those patients waiting for their cancelled elective operations who are asked to do something every day to be ready for when the NHS is ready for them. There are some steps you can take to improve your physical and mental health ahead of the calamity of contracting any serious illness. There are many changes you can make to reduce the risks of an illness. Even small changes can make a big difference. If you can focus on certain areas of your lifestyle, you can make a big change like doing regular exercise, having balanced healthy diet, taking control of your weight, quitting or reducing smoking, reducing alcohol intake and taking control of your comorbidities. All this can help to make your health better. Your heart and lungs have to work harder whilst fighting the infections to help the body heal. If you are already active, they will be used to this. Whilst you are in good health, try to increase your activity levels. Sometimes when I'm doing preoperative assessments, patients tell me, doctor, I'm putting on weight. I can't follow my routine exercise schedule. I can't go to the gym as I'm isolating. I advise them that simple exercises could help too. Brisk walking, cycling, gardening, or playing with your children are all helpful. If in doubt, always check with your doctor first what type of exercise is most appropriate for you. Activities that improve your strength and balance, like walking up and down the stairs and practicing sit to stand will also be useful to increase your ability to fight coronavirus and for your recovery after an illness. Set up good habits, fix it in a schedule. For example, 20 minutes of daily aerobic exercise is a good regime. Look for the ideas for exercises you can do at home on the NHS website. There are several videos, YouTube clips online available as well. Remember to exercise regularly. Also try to select exercise regime which you enjoy doing because if you enjoy it, you are more likely to follow it. We would be doing some physical activity at the end of today's session. So those who can participate, please do so.
your body needs to boost the immunity to fight against infections and to repair itself after an illness. Eating a healthy balanced diet can really help. Try to prepare home cooked meals. That way you can control the amount of fats, sugars you are using. So it is a much healthier option. Sometimes you feel like having a change from your own home cooked meals. You can make some concessions and can indulge in treats like takeaway, ready meals, but try to keep it to minimum. It takes 20 minutes to register that you are full, so try smaller portion sizes. Also, drinking fluids regularly is very important. Body systems work better if you drink enough fluids. So remember to keep yourself well hydrated. If you are overweight, Losing weight can help reduce the stress on your heart and lungs. In addition, it can help to lower your blood pressure, improve your blood sugar levels, reduce pain in your joints and therefore you can exercise easily. It also reduces your risk of blood clots after being less active whilst recovering from an infection or illness. It reduces the risk of wound infections should you need any invasive procedures. It also allows you to exercise more easily and it's been observed that people with obesity fare worse with lung infections. Alcohol can have many effects on the body, but importantly, it can reduce the liver's ability to produce the building blocks necessary for healing. Make sure you are drinking within the recommended limits or lower to improve your body's ability to heal after an illness. Now, how can you achieve that? Have some alcohol free days. Alternate alcohol with a soft drink. Try to break the spell. Stopping smoking is hard, but the good news is that quitting or cutting down can reduce length of stay in hospital, improves body's healing process and lung functions. Preparing yourself to face the pandemic is a real opportunity to commit to stop smoking. Now we'll talk about some medical conditions. If you have any long term medical problems, consider taking advice from your doctor or nurse and ask for a review of medications, especially if you feel your health is not as good as it could be. If you are diabetic and if it is in a milder form, you could be just controlling it by watching your diet. Good control of your blood sugar is really important to reduce your risk of infections or any other complications. Think about your diet and weight. Check your sugar levels and if you are taking medications for diabetes like uh, tablets or injections, and if you feel it's your blood sugar levels are going off track, then talk to your diabetes nurse or diabetic team in hospital early to see if they need to make any changes to your treatment. Blood pressure should be controlled to safe levels to reduce your risk of stroke and other health complications, including heart problems. Have your blood pressure checked regularly and if it is high, your doctor can check your medications and make any changes needed to keep your blood pressure under control. All regular medications controlling your blood pressure, heart conditions and other long term health conditions should be continued unless advised otherwise by your doctor. So make a habit of taking all your medications regularly. Anemia can be simply described as a low blood count. If you have been bleeding, say in women, if they suffer from heavy periods, or if you have a chronic medical condition like kidney problems, a blood test can check whether you are anemic. If you are, you should talk to your doctor about treatment to improve your blood count. Anemia causes less oxygen in blood. All systems in the body and important organs need enough oxygen to function properly. 
if you drop your hemoglobin or blood count to a critical level there is a chance that you might be needing a blood transfusion so therefore treating anemia in time is really important to avoid blood transfusion if possible the effect of anemia on the recovery is that if you are anemic you feel very tired and weak whilst you are recovering from an illness and therefore getting your blood count within normal range and treating anemia is really important the pandemic has taken its toll on everybody's mental health in different ways these are testing times for all of us therefore it's likely to feel anxious and sometimes depressed many techniques including mindfulness relaxation breathing exercises and yoga could help you relax try to get enough sleep give space to each other forming support groups with your family and friends and engaging in virtual activities or chats could be helpful too these times will change and we will be having normal circumstances again so try to be positive towards life your doctor can help you by offering support systems available for the betterment of your mental health this brings me to the end of my talk i have tried to keep it pretty simple and straightforward the take home message is small steps taken in the right direction can make big changes in our health and sooner we start better it is thank you for listening um when i started i said i was an oncoplastic breast surgeon and i thought i'd fill in a little bit more about that and you can hear from the word oncoplastic onco cancer so we all treat breast cancer if we take this title and plastic because we use plastics techniques as part of the treatment for breast cancer and the number one aim is oncological safety safe treatment of breast cancer but if we possibly can we should reduce the negative impact on a woman and on her breasts and make her feel as much like herself as she can afterwards and as you would expect for many women that's that's really important that they maintain good breast shape if possible minimize scars and reduce the negative impact of the treatment they've had to have and for this we've adapted plastics techniques or what what was traditionally considered plastic te plastics techniques uh, as part of our breast surgery and that's for both breast reconstruction but also for taking less than the whole breast and we use reduction techniques sometimes and and that's an example of what oncoplastic breast surgery is all about uh, and certainly i feel very privileged to be part of this profession because we have a chance to help women as they tackle breast cancer and so uh, today i want to talk more about that what can you do as a woman what can you do to reduce your chance of getting breast cancer and also if you have had breast cancer, what can you do to reduce the chance that breast cancer may come back to visit you a second time in your life? And I think the very first thing and the most important thing I want to say, and I'm probably going to repeat it again during this talk, is that there's no room for guilt here. So the real reason why women get breast cancer essentially is because they're women with breasts. It's not something you've done or not done, something you've eaten or not eaten. It's not some exercise regime or where you live or any of those things. And of course, there are contributions, and I'm going to talk about that today. But it doesn't follow that someone gets breast cancer because, or someone's breast cancer comes back because. It isn't like that. And the impact that you can make by doing these things is important, but I'll tell you now that there are women who follow every single rule in the book that should mean they're low risk for breast cancer and they still get breast cancer and the number one reason as I said before is because they're women with breasts so this is something that a lot of women get and our lifetime risk 
is regarded as something like one in nine. So about one in nine women will get breast cancer. Some people say one in eight. Uh, and so it's, it's a fact of life for many women. In terms of men, as you know, men can get breast cancer too. And about one in a hundred breast cancers are male breast cancers. So um, it's not just a woman's experience, but the vast majority, of course, are women. So I'm going to focus on on advice for women today and what can you do? What can you do to reduce your chance of breast cancer? I think also you'll you'll notice an overlap today in some of the other talks uh, in terms of general health and lifestyle factors and these things are very important but let's talk about your family related risk first of all. So in recent years there's been a lot of uh, press coverage um, and and social media coverage given to people who have a gene mutation which puts them at risk of breast cancer and um, the BRCA or BRCA gene mutations are the best known and certainly the most common and there's been high profile celebrities who've uh, been open and gone public about their treatment and their experience and their surgery but I think it's important to see this in context and as far as we know less than five percent of breast cancers are caused by single or known genetic factors and it is true to say that genetic factors will have a play in other breast cancers perhaps to give people a predisposition but the clear gene mutations that we can test for they are rare um, and in those families there will be histories of breast or sometimes breast and ovarian cancer or occasionally just ovarian cancer at young ages uh, from from approximately the age of 30 it can be younger but in the, in the 30s and in the 40s especially it would be very common but it doesn't follow rules and um, this is something that um, I think if you if you if you know that in your family many members are affected by breast cancer it's perfectly reasonable to go and have a conversation with your family doctor and see if you qualify for a referral for a more detailed risk assessment and certainly our department is involved in that and we work together with the regional genetics team where necessary. But for the majority of women there isn't a history in their family other than perhaps an older family member or a more distant relative but with one in nine women being affected you would expect that perhaps in most of our families we would know of a relative who would be affected by breast cancer and that is not unusual. So what can we do? What can we do to reduce our risk? Let's focus on the positives. So some of them are things that you that you'll think oh there we go again um, I'm being told to exercise and lose weight and all of that but I think it's it's good to know the facts and then it's over to you. So what are the facts? The facts are known from big population studies and the important lifestyle factors are body mass index, they're a sedentary lifestyle or how much exercise you take and how active you are and then also alcohol intake is very important and alongside these things is the use of additional hormones and we'll talk about that at the end. So let's talk about lifestyle factors first of all and there's, there's going to be more discussions about this today but we know that women who have a high body mass index are at greater risk. And this holds true for, for developing breast cancer, but also developing a relapse of breast cancer. And this is one of the hardest things because there certainly are families where people tend to be heavier and where genes predispose you to carrying weight um, and also habits of a lifetime come into play. But uh, the facts are there. Having a high body mass index does put you at risk both of primary breast cancer and of a relapse. And alongside this, linked to this, a sedentary lifestyle. So the typical couch potato description. And I think we don't all have to be marathon runners. Uh, we don't all have to be super skinny and lean, but the advice is to be active. Um, and this is a focus of other of the talks today. And there's good evidence from big population studies that an active lifestyle reduces your risk both of breast cancer 
and also of breast cancer relapse and of course it has many many other health benefits so that's something that you can all take into your own hands the third major lifestyle factor is alcohol intake and we know that the more you drink the higher your risk it seems less clear the link to cancer relapse but alcohol is linked to other cancers as well um, and it may be one of the reasons why we're seeing uh, an increase overall in breast cancer across the world. Uh, this may well be the link. And you'll know yourselves that alcohol has a very big part to play in many of our cultures and social events. Um, but it is true to say that anything more than moderate drinking can put you at risk. So those are three major factors and, and what it seems that the link between all of these is, is oestrogen. So many of you will know that breast cancer is linked to oestrogen and to the oestrogen background or milieu in the body. It's linked to how your body handles oestrogen. And if you carry a lot of weight, it means that there's a big source of oestrogen in your fat, in your peripheral fat of your body, the paddy, the COVID cuddles. <laughs> so that actually produces oestrogen and it can increase the amount of circulating oestrogen in your body and we think that's very important. In terms of sedentary lifestyle, well of course there's a link between being overweight and being sedentary but also a sedentary lifestyle can change the way your body handles lipids and fats and alcohol affects the way your liver works and also changes the way your body metabolizes fats uh, and estrogen. So this appears to be the link. Um, there's lots of ongoing work in this area. There's lots we don't know about this, but we do know that these are three key factors. So these are things that you can do something about that you can take into your hands. But remember what I said at the start, there's no room for guilt here. You don't get breast cancer because you're overweight. You don't get breast cancer because you drink alcohol. You get breast cancer because you're a woman with breasts. So there's no room for guilt here, but it is something that we can take into our own hands and, and do something about and modify our own risk. Finally, the very controversial topic of hormones use. So there's two main things that we do as women where we use hormones. We take the oral contraceptive pill to regulate our own fertility in our fertile years and then we take hormone replacement therapy or HRT around the time of the menopause. In terms of the oral contraceptive pill the evidence is not particularly high quality and it's very mixed it's very difficult to do population studies but I think the key factor here is that breast cancer is relatively unusual in young women and therefore, even though there is the evidence of an increased risk, risk when you're on the oral contraceptive pill, if you think of the principle of if you have something that's almost at zero and you double it, it will still almost be zero. So very low risk doubled is still very low risk. And it seems that when you come off the pill, your risk returns very, very quickly back to the population risk. So it would be a poor explanation of risk and a poor application of evidence to advise women to stop using such things as the oral contraceptive pill because of breast cancer risk. And this is really only a factor if someone has a naturally very high risk of breast cancer. So in patients who have very strong family histories or who have a known gene mutation, perhaps in those women they should not use hormonal means of contraception. Um, but in the general population, it's safe to use. Um, it doesn't mean that there's no link at all, but it's safe to use. Then we come to HRT, which there's been many discussions about HRT across the years. So it is true to say that if you take HRT for more than five years, beyond the age of a natural menopause, that you increase your risk of breast cancer. But again, that the size of that increase in risk needs to be very carefully discussed with a woman 
when she is considering whether to, to use HRT or not. And it is possible to describe risk for an individual, taking into account their risk factors, for example, their weight and their levels of activity and their family history, and also other things in their life that may have affected their risks of breast cancer. So I think individual women should look at it and should have expert advice as to their relative risk should they take HRT and then they can make up their mind because also there'll be many women listening to this who know that their quality of life can be very very seriously impacted by the menopause and by the drop in natural body estrogens and it can be an absolutely essential part of their life to have HRT and to use HRT to smooth into the menopause and to support their quality of life as they go into the menopause. And to me, as long as women have the facts such as we know them and understand that in the context of their own life and bodies and histories, then they should be able to make that decision themselves. But it is true to say that taking HRT for more than five years beyond the age of the natural menopause does increase your risk of breast cancer. But that of course doesn't mean that if you have an early menopause that taking HRT is a problem. So if you have an early menopause, for example, some women have to have surgery and have their ovaries removed at a young age. And in these women, it's really important for them to have hormone replacement therapy for their bones, for their quality of life. And there is no evidence that giving HRT up to the age of a natural menopause, so approximately the age of 50, that does not increase their risks of breast cancer. There's no evidence for that. Um, and certainly there's good evidence that that supports other aspects of their health. So when we're making our, our decisions about our health and the use of hormone-based treatments, we do have to bear in mind the risks of breast cancer. However, it needs to be seen as part of the bigger picture of our health. And that's why, for example, we've discussed many lifestyle factors. We haven't talked about smoking and there isn't a very strong link between smoking and breast cancer. However, if you uh, reduce your risk of breast cancer by lots of different measures, lifestyle measures, etc., but you carry on smoking, it makes no sense to me because smoking is very strongly linked to all sorts of cancers and also to lung disease and also to ischemic heart disease and vessel disease. And so it makes no sense to me to reduce your risks in one area, but not in another. So certainly um, you always need to look at these things in context and as part of the bigger picture of your general health. OK, so I'd encourage you all. Remember, there's no room for guilt, but there's plenty of room for us to use the evidence, get healthy, take things into our own hands, be positive and do the best we can. But no room for guilt. Thank you. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Poonam Baga. I'm a consultant ophthalmologist with a keen interest in the science of being aware of this moment. In the Western medicine, this has now been given the name mindfulness. Although mindfulness in Western medical science has been explored for the past three or so decades, this is an old contemplative practice from cultures all over the world. Today, I'm bringing you the information that we have been gathering through the observations of science and also in my case, through my journey with awakening to the present moment and how it helps us to cope with the constant change and some of the adversity which is ever present in all our lives. This is especially topical in the current times of COVID pandemic when a multitude of challenging emotions are arising within us and unfolding around us. So my hope today is that I will bring to you some information around the science of stress and how current awareness of this present moment or mindfulness can help us deal with it. Even more importantly, I think I would like you to all 
by the end of today learn how to recognize stress within us because we have quite often these reactions which we ignore. The impact that stress has on our body at the level of the cells can have long-term consequences. And that is the reason why it is so important to be aware of when we are stressed, how we react to emerging situations that we deem unfavorable, and subsequent to that, develop strategies which will take us towards resilience. So if by the end of today, I have brought to you the information regarding how to focus on your breath as an awareness tool, if I have aroused within you a profound curiosity about your own inner reactions, which sometimes happen so spontaneously and which are often thought to be the norm, but which you might learn can be changed into deliberate responses, I will deem this talk to be a resounding success. I also hope that you will learn some strategies for enhancing your well being if you feel the need for these, of course. So, as we go further, I would like your attention to be focused on this slide. And if your mind has wandered, I would invite you to gently navigate it back towards the current moment and be attentive to the slide and the bubbles and see where you are. Are you the person on the left who's got a mind full of a myriad of thoughts, ideas, worries? Or are you the person on the right who is enjoying this beautiful scene focused only on what is happening? The chances are that you are, like most human beings, having a head full of worries, unlike our pets, who are much more likely to be mindful and to be on the focused on the present moment. And that brings me to this very often bandied around word now, mindfulness. We spend such a lot of time ruminating in the past, having regrets, ideas of worry or anger. And when we are not doing that, we have flights of fancy to the future or we worry about things which may or may not evolve. We engage in this behavior subconsciously. Mindfulness is a very conscious practice. It is the art of being present with intention. So the intent here is critical. We are present to whatever it is that is arising and unfolding within us and around us in this moment. And there are two important qualities of this presence. Acceptance of whatever it is that is coming up without a need to change and without judgment of a narrative of this is good, this is bad. It is what it is. Some of these things seem rather difficult because that's not what we have practiced for all our lives. So some of these practices are new and will require commitment and discipline. So why do we need to be mindful? Why do we need to be aware of this current moment? I will come to that slowly as we progress through this talk. What is stress? 
it is a reaction that happens in the body quite often at a subconscious level. Whenever our brain perceives a threat to our survival. In the past, when we lived in the forest, when we were cavemen, it was for physical survival from wild animals, from other tribes. But now quite often in this civilized world, these reactions happen to emotional assaults, which our brain cannot discriminate from those previous physical assaults. The reactions which are wired are fight or flight. So we either fight back for our survival or we fly away, we run away from the risk, from the danger. Sometimes the body goes into freeze mode because the mind sees the challenge as too big for us to engage in either the fight or the flight reaction. These are conditioned reactions which we have learned through life. When we perceive a threat, our initial reaction may not have been fear, but once the brain recognizes that threat as fearful, we then develop a conditioned reaction. And for us to realize and change that, we have to bring it into our awareness, into our cognitive mind. So how the stress response normally happens is for us to have a faster heart rate so that the heart can pump more blood every minute to the muscles of the legs so that we can run away or the muscles of the arms so that we can fight back. Our breathing becomes more rapid so that we can get more oxygen. Our pupils become more dilated so that we can get more visual information. But we also become tunnel vision where we see only the thing which is in front of us, ignoring all other extra cues which are not required or deemed important by the mind and the body. In our day-to-day -day stresses, we may have tension in our temples, which we may not actually think about. Our jaw may be tight or clenched. We may scrunch up our shoulders without actually even being aware. There may be some tightness in our chest. We may have a queasy sensation in our stomach. So these are some of the stress signs that we all know about, but may ignore. So the science of stress is that this normal reaction, which we all face from time to time, is due to the sympathetic stimulation. Sympathetic system in the body is part of the nervous system, which gets activated in sympathy. During an acute stress response, this leads to fight or flight reaction. But sometimes, in our everyday lives, with so many little stresses, we go into maladaptive strategies and these stresses become a constant companion, having an impact on our body at the level of the cells, thereby producing and contributing to lifestyle diseases such as high blood pressure, diabetes, and several other chronic diseases. So if we can learn to bring some of this subconscious knowledge to our conscious mind, we will empower ourselves because then we can make a, an informed decision to employ strategies which will help us deal with stress. So bringing the unconscious to the conscious is what I am here to talk about. So as we are here in this moment, sitting here perhaps on your chairs or maybe in your bed, wherever you are, my invitation is to just take yourself back into the body, 
away from the thoughts of the mind and focus on wherever it is in the body that you think you feel the stress. Some of us feel it in the tightness of the muscles of the scalp. Others can have very tight temples or just bring your attention to the jaw and see what that feels like. How are your shoulders? The palms of your hands? The muscles in your chest? How does the abdomen feel? Is there any tightness in the area of your hips? So these are some of the areas where we will feel the cues that the body gives us all the time, but which we frequently ignore because our minds are very busy. So to achieve a balanced life, we need to set an intention. Intention setting is about having a knowledge of our own needs and information regarding what is expected of us. Quite often there are competing demands within self, the needs of the family, friends and work colleagues, and how to achieve a happy medium sometimes requires strategic planning. Being aware of our breath, using breath as a tool has proven to be of help at times when we find ourselves overwhelmed with all the demands that are being pushed our way. And how does it help? When we breathe with awareness, with a commitment to pay attention to the arising breath, this current present breath, it spontaneously slows down. Our breathing becomes slower. And as the breathing becomes slower, the muscle in the body called the diaphragm takes longer excursions. There are two nerves, one on either side of the body, which pass through the diaphragm. These two vagal nerves are stimulated as the diaphragm goes up and down. And this counters the sympathetic overreaction. And also when you are focusing on the breath, it is not really possible to be attentive to the breath that's gone or the one that's yet to come. We can only ever be aware of the current breath, the present breath. I'm going to lead you into a guided breath awareness exercise. This will last for about eight to 10 minutes. And I invite you to notice whatever it is that you feel when the exercise comes to an end. This is something that you can use in your day-to-day -day life. You can do it for 10 minutes, but you can also do it only for one minute to get some benefit. So just as you're sitting wherever you are, my invitation to you is to notice the contact of your body with your seat. Noticing your posture, any areas of discomfort, any tightness or tension. And just as you're here for this next 10 minutes with nothing to do and nowhere to go, but just spend this time nurturing and nourishing yourself. Please bring your attention to your breath. As the air brushes past the nostrils to find its way into the length of the nose. 
observing how it touches the inside of your nose and then subtly spreads at the back of your throat. And as you're here in this moment, with this breath, if there are any thoughts, any distractions, just acknowledging them and letting them be, whilst you continue to bring your focus back to the breath, the rhythmic cycle of your in-breath and out-breath, noticing how the breath flows into the body and how it flows out. Just being here with an intent to be focused only on your breath. If there are any thoughts, just letting, letting them be, like the clouds in the sky floating in and out whilst the sky stays there, calm and peaceful in the background. And as you breathe in and out, observing the expansion and contraction of your chest, the rising and falling of the belly, noticing inflow following the outflow. Every in-breath followed by the out-breath. Just breathing in and breathing out. Being with your breath. Noticing whatever it is that is unfolding within you. If there's any particular emotion which takes your fancy, pausing on that and bringing your breath to that emotion. Being aware of any sensations or absence of sensations, any tightness or tension, just being here and now with this breath, breathing in and breathing out. And if you feel like closing your eyes, you may do so. But if you want to keep your eyes open, that's fine too. Imagining the breath flowing from the top of your head into the muscles of your scalp, into your eyes and eyelids, flowing down your cheeks, bringing the focus on the muscles of your temples and your ears, the angle of your jaw, Observing whatever it is that is arising without a narrative, without giving it any positive or negative value. Noticing the breath spreading from the nape of your neck into your upper back, flowing into your shoulders and upper arms into the elbows and your forearms. Attentive to any sensations which may be arising, any tingling or numbness. Noticing the sensations in the palms of your hands. Observing how the fingertips are. Just being with the breath as it flows through your torso, from the chest into the belly, the expansion and contraction of the chest, the rising and falling of the belly, 
Observing the sensations which arise when the breath flows through the hips into your thighs. Equally being attentive if there are no sensations, because that's okay too. Imagining the breath flowing through the knees into your lower legs, from the lower legs into your feet, from the feet into the Mother Earth. So just as you're here, in this current moment, focusing on this breath, not the past, not the future, just this breath, celebrating this gift of life, because with every new breath, there is a life, a fresh life. When we stop breathing, the life leaves. So just being with your breath, breathing in and breathing out, bringing your attention to the area of your heart, Imagining the breath, caressing the heart as it flows through it. Observing how the breath might give oxygen to all the blood in the area of your heart as it comes from the lungs and then spreads from the heart through all the blood tubes into every cell in this body that is you. Perhaps pausing in this moment to be curious about the expansion of your consciousness beyond the body as you realize the deep integration of the environment outside with that inside the body. The connection between the plants and the humans. So just as you continue to focus on the anchor of your breath, breathing in and out, I invite you once again to observe with curiosity whatever it is that is arising within. Just noticing this. Breathing in and breathing out. Just being with your breath. Breathing in and out. And then gently opening your eyes keeping your gaze soft and noticing what is it that's unfolding within and what is there outside. Staying totally attentive only to this moment, being here and now, staying with your breath, And as you stay with your breath, perhaps noticing and observing and feeling the calmness inside. You may realize that this is a tool available to you at all times. Your breath is your eternal companion. However, to utilize the breath in this constructive way, you need to make a commitment to yourself to be disciplined about remembering to pause and focus on the breath. This commitment requires you to think about it. So you think of your brain as a muscle. When we go to the gym to tone our muscles, we use them again and again. Similarly, 
the more you practice with awareness and with intent, the more toned your brain gets, the more it remembers that breath is a tool available to it at all times, especially those times when we are challenged and when our sympathetic system goes into an overdrive and our conditioned reactions present themselves. This is a picture which shows how paths can be established. In the brain, there are neural pathways. To establish the neural pathway is very similar to forming a track on the grass. When you first start to walk on the grass, it's pristine, but after a few days, some patches begin to go missing. The grass disappears. And then as you walk on that path again and again, you get an established track, as you see in the last picture. If we continue to practice something again and again, the new neural pathways form and become more and more easy to trigger. So if we remember to focus on our breath just for a few minutes every day, in about six to eight weeks time, it can become a habit which will help us every time we feel reactive, but we have to think about it and we have to practice it. We have one life and letting stress take over appears to be an awful waste of this life. So this is an invitation to learn, to have an intention to be attentive to the experience of this present moment with curiosity. But there are two further qualities required for this. And that is acceptance of whatever it is that is arising. Accepting that sometimes we get what we get and not what we desire. And the second quality of non-judgment. Stopping our narrative of defining things as good or bad. Just looking at them as they are. And when we start to do that, we suddenly realize the value of neutrality. And of course, nothing stays forever. Everything is transient. You have long, dark nights, but they're followed by a bright day, sometimes a rainy day, sometimes a cloudy day, but it's never the same. It never stays night all the time and neither does it remain light all the time. So remembering that whatever it is that is currently troubling us is transient, ephemeral, it will pass. So as we come to an end of this talk, remember to take pauses for breathing even if it's only for two breaths, because to begin with, after two breaths, your mind will wander and you will have to navigate it back to the breath again. Checking into yourself to feel whatever it is that is going on within you, especially when the going gets tough. Be aware of your own biases and your perceptions and having an awareness that criticism often produces conditioned sympathetic reactions, which make us feel angry or sad or resentful. When we bring compassion into our interactions, the outcomes are more product productive and teams more effective. And that goes not only for teams, but for our own body, our own body cells and organs, and also for our families. 
So I'm really grateful to you for spending this time to listen to what I have to bring to you. If you have any further questions that have arisen out of this talk, please feel free to send me an email on p underscore baga underscore zero one at yahoo.co.uk. Thank you again. Bye for now. Hi, my name is Dawn Hildy. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in September 2012. Um, I had a lumpectomy, chemo, radio, uh, blood clot, uh, an oophorectomy, and then I was put on to anastrozole, which I am still on now. Okay, so back then it was probably one of the most shocking, surreal, well not probably one of the most, it was the most shocking, surreal experience that I had ever um, encountered. I had three young children, married to Ian, and it was an absolute bolt out of the blue and a complete and utter shock to me. Um, I think when you go to the Pink Rose Suite, you always expect your lump to be um, benign, just a lump, nothing major, nothing significant. Um, but within two hours of going that very first time, I had a bit of an inclination that something wasn't right. And a week later, Thursday night, I met, went and met Jenny and Lisa, the uh, the breast care nurse, and was told with Ian that I, that I did have breast cancer. Um, and I remember one of the things was both asking um, at the time was, was I going to die? Um, because I think that's what we associated with um, cancer with. Fast forward though, nine years, I'm, I'm here and I'm absolutely fine. Um, however, it, it's been a journey getting here, um, mentally um, and physically. To start with, I think most people that I've talked to are sort of super strong. Um, we get on with it, we do whatever we're told. We have this wonderful security blanket of, with, of all the staff at the hospital. But then all of a sudden, when you finish all your treatment, that security blanket goes. And I think for me, that was probably one of the hardest, hardest points. And the enormity of what I had gone through and my family had gone through probably hit me at that at that moment. I remember having chemo though and thinking I just want to meet somebody who um, is a similar age to me and also understands what I am going through. I'm one of these people in life I like to talk about things, I like to rationalise things and I, I sort of like to be prepared about potentially what, what is going to happen. And everyone there was amazing. Jenny, um, Lisa, um, I asked lots and lots of questions. Um, but I, I wanted to talk to somebody that had gone through it. So about halfway through my treatment, this bundle of fun and um, plonked herself next to me in a chair on the uh, chemo unit in Scunthorpe. And that was real breakthrough mo moment for me. I met Anne and Angela and we became really firm friends um, as, as a result of us having cancer. And it made me think about the lack of resources out there um, for people of maybe my age um, who had young children. And it, it, it really, it, it stayed with me and um, that thought um, I didn't do anything about it for quite a while but it did stay with me that thought I mean my first thing was obviously recovering and getting better from having having the cancer Um, so forward nine years has the cancer changed me absolutely okay Um, once you've been faced with a scenario like that um, I think I don't tend to take things for granted as much anymore. Um, it'll always be here in the back of my head, um, you know, and that, that sort of worry, I suppose, will never ever completely disappear, but it's not the first thing on my mind every day. Um, 
what else let me think so i i'm one of those annoying people in life that i have to whatever sort of challenges i do come up against i have to use them as something to shape me as i move forward in you know in life and this this was no different so that thought about not having people to talk to i decided a year after i finished my treatment to set up a support group in scunthorpe called buzz and family support that started in the january 2014 and it just grew and grew um, a year later we had a children's group because that was a really big deal to me um, that I think I can cope with anything but my biggest worry when I was having the treatment was my children and my husband um, I, I can handle anything that's thrown at me yes it's not pleasant but I would rather it was me every day of the week but my biggest fear was what was going through their little minds at the time so a year later I set up a children's group forward on another year we set up a choir called buzz and bells and kept raising or kept getting donated money and i was we decided in september 2019 to open hope house in bottisford and that is a place for people to go who are undergoing treatment who have um come through the other side um and somewhere for us to go and find new interests new hobbies and really help us get our minds in a better place um we as a group realized that by doing these kind of activities um all sorts flower arranging mini golf you name it we've tried it um but we've come out of it with like new interests new hobbies and that is really great for your mind also being able to talk to people that understand there are always going to be people um you know my friends were amazing my family were amazing but the biggest difficulty for me was i don't think i could be completely honest with them so it was so important for me to be able to have those honest conversations with people um that got me um so having that peer support is so important also at hope house we have a counselor we have a beauty room um i know when i was undergoing my chemo I, I absolutely hated myself how i looked how i felt um you know and having somebody i don't know try pamper you a little bit make you feel a little bit better is is brilliant so we raised thirty thousand pounds set up hope house uh, we've had a pandemic to cope with as well but we're, we're doing okay still we are um, not quite providing the level of service we were before but we will be as soon as we can reopen how else has it changed me um i think i've gone for my dreams a little bit more uh, i'd always wanted to be a teacher and i got my degree before i had cancer but i went and got a pgce and i now teach full-time in a local secondary school um how else very probably less tolerant of silly things now uh, i try not to let things bother me too much but cancer is cruel it's horrible um it strips you right back to your bare bones um but it has defined me but in a positive way it, i've come out of it with some amazing friends I, i've lost people on the way too but i've come out with the most gorgeous set of friends i i'm really i don't know I've, I've gone for my dreams a little bit more um i do try and keep my brain in a good place so mentally so i do things like mindfulness to help me i also um talk about how i'm feeling and recognize when i'm struggling and be, and sort of be honest about that and i also um like walk loads um i think the pandemic has also helped that but i walk and walk and walk if i'm struggling with something i put my earphones in put a podcast on and i just walk don't be on your own don't struggle 
um the support that you'll get from the pink rose suite the staff are incredible i mean i've always called them my angels because they absolutely are they they saved my life but don't struggle don't be on your own never feel like that and i mean i'm not this isn't to advertise hope house but look us up on facebook and try and find us but but cancer it is it is tough it's hard it will get you down you will not sleep you'll struggle with lots of things but just just try dig deep and keep focused on the end goal i never saw anybody that was sort of nine ten years down the line and i wish i had been able to um because i think at that that time i thought that it was forever and it was going to affect me forever and ever and ever okay but it it has affected me but it hasn't all been bad okay um i don't know if that's helped um but do as you're told listen to the advice they are amazing um the team of staff at the pink rose staff uh, at the pink rose suite are amazing our hospitals are fantastic um and there are there's lots and lots of help out there for you and surround yourself by the right people okay take care hello my name is rebecca and i am the co-director of r and r productions and bollywood bells we are an entertainment company that supply dancers for weddings corporate events parties functions and um, we also supply dance workshops for education as well um, so I'm here today um, in association with International Women's Day and to promote obviously health through physical activity. Um, so our job is, is very physical, obviously at the moment um, we're all craving that physical activity and exercise um, that we're not currently doing. Um, so obviously, you know, at the moment a lot of our dancers are doing a lot of home workouts. Um, so that's really what we're here to promote today. Um, just the fun of doing some home workouts every day. Um, and today we've got a bit of a Bollywood Bangra workout for you today that you can do at home. So hopefully you'll find this really fun, um, something a bit different. Um, so the first little bit, we're gonna start off with a bit of an arm, an arm combination. So we're going to take one arm out to the side, one, then the other arm, two. Then we're going to join into a prayer position. So it goes one, two, three. Then from here, we're going to go open, cross, open. Then we go cheeks, a little twist. We step, take your hand under your chin, put your arm down and we do a nod, okay? So that's the first little bit. So we go arm, arm, prayer, open, cross, open, cheeks, twist, chin, nod, and again. So we go arm, arm together, open, cross, open, cheeks, twist, chin, nod, okay? So we've got one and two, three and four, five, six, seven, nod, eight. From here, our feet to go in, step, step, and a double step. Okay, so that's going right, left, and two on the right. And your arms on this step are pulling, pulling, and a double pull. Okay, so it looks like this. One, two, and a double pull. Okay, from here we're lifting up our left leg and our arms are punching down. Then we swap, punch down. So we've got two of those, so we go. One, two, double, pull, down, down. From here, you kick your left leg through and it goes step, step. So it does like a, a swoop, step, step. Okay, so that's all of the first little bit. So let's try that without the music. So it goes, arm, arm, prayer. Open, cross, open. Cheeks, twist, chin, nod to go, pull, Pull and a double pull, leg, leg, sweep, step, step. Okay, so we just go up to there, we do the nod. Then from here, we do one arm up to the side. So you just do a bit of an arm up. We do the other arm up, 
and then I want your best shakes. Shake, 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 shake. So you're kind of facing the left side, okay? So it goes on, and your feet are apart, on, and then we go shake, two, three, four, okay? Should we try it up to there? So let's here, let's add our little chorus bit on. So we've just finished our shake to the side. So from here, our arms are doing a bit of like a, a chicken movement and our feet are doing like a little dab. So your right foot is going forward, side, forward, side. So you're just kind of rebounding off it. So try that again. So it's going tap forward, tap to the side, tap forward, tap to the side. So four movements, one, two, three, four. And your arms are just moving up and down like this. One, two, three. So they move every time you do a foot tap, okay? So we've just done our arm. We've just done our arm. We've shaking, 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 shaking. So from here, you're going forward, side, forward, side. Then your arms just come to your groin and you're going to walk forward, uh, three walks, and you're going to go right, left, right. So we go one, two, three, okay? So go from the chicken step. So we go forward, side, forward, side, one, two, three, and then we go bounce, bounce, um, to a heel. So your shoulders are going one, two, you transfer your weight onto your right leg, your left leg goes onto your heel and your hands are just a little pinch. You can see that. So your first finger in your thumb, okay? So from the little walks forward, it goes one, two, three, bounce, bounce, up. Then we go the other way. Bounce, bounce, up. And again the other way, bounce, bounce, up. Okay? So let's try that little chorus bit. So we've done our shakes to face the side. We're doing the tap forward, tap side. Tap forward, tap side. One, two, three to go. Bounce, bounce, up. Bounce, bounce, up. Bounce, bounce, up. Then from here we do four leg lifts. So it looks like this. One, two, three, four. So we do one turn. So your leg is going up, down, up and down. And as you're doing it, you're turning round, two, three, four. I hope that makes sense. So let's just um, recap over that chorus. We've just done our shakes to the side. So we've got one, two, three, four, five and six, seven and eight. One and two, three and four. Go round, two, three, four. This girl bit, so we've just done our ripple, ripple. Right, from here, a little bit tricky, but I think you'll get it. We're going over with our left leg and it's going forward, back, forward, back forward, back. So a little bit like our chorus step where we're moving it forward into the side. Same thing, um, but moving it forward and back. That's it. And your arm does a similar movement. It goes forward, open, forward, open, forward, open. So it's three times, okay? So we've got one, we've got two, we've got three, and then this left hand is like a lasso over your head, a lasso and a turn, okay? So it's just doing a lasso like that. And your body's doing a turn, so your left leg's coming over to make you spin to the front, okay? So just to recap over that a little bit, so we've just done our ripple, ripple. So from here, we're going over, 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 and turn it around, okay? So, from here, we are going to take our uh, right arm up, our left arm up, so it's our little chorus, just the bit before the chorus, we repeat that bit, okay? So you've done your turn, you go one, you go two, you shake, 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 shake. And it's a bit of a trick there, it doesn't go back into the chorus, it's one little bit before it does. Nice and easy, we do four swings, so your hands just on your thighs, you're swaying to the right first. You go one, so your body's dipping down and up. Three, four, 
and then it does a full circle so we're going all the way round okay so four halves and then a full circle so we've just done arm arm shake 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 and one and two and three and four a full circle and then it goes into your left arm up so half of it and then a shake to go back into your chorus which we all know one two three shoulder shoulder up shoulder shoulder up shoulder shoulder up go round two three four and then we finish arm up with a little twist to say ta-da okay so those are all our steps um hopefully we've got all that last bit shall i just go over that last bit again um let's go from our girl bit okay so let's go from our sways and then we'll try it right from the beginning so we've got our sway sway down down our four hips going round to go hip 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 hip, hip, hip. to go head ribs head ribs head ribs and ripple ripple to go over to go over to go over last of it round a little trick because it doesn't really go into the chorus you think it's going to but it doesn't it goes into our sways two three four and then a full all the way round to go arm up another little shake to go chorus two three four one two three and bounce bounce up bounce bounce up bounce bounce up last bit goes round and big finish okay right hopefully you've got all of that